Hello everybody, as you watch this review of the Daily Wire quote unquote comedy Lady Ballers, you may notice some things are just off about the video, especially in terms of production. Particularly that some of the images and sequences are blurred out, leaving only the audio. This is because, despite advertising that no critics would touch such an unwoke movie, my video review was actually doing quite well, in fact reaching number two on Google search results for Lady Baller's reviews before the entire video was claimed. Now, this claim uh, not only consisted of footage and scenes from the video that were fair use because they were transformatively used, they were sped up, reversed, slowed down, and just changed in general and taken out of context so reasonably they couldn't be seen as a substitute for the original, but also still images and the Daily Wire's own trailers? They're, they're trying to claim the, the promotional material they use. Oh, and a ton of my footage featuring me. And really, who could guess why the Daily Wire would want to silence such a review? Maybe it's because I point out how sad and pathetic of a power fantasy it is for Jeremy Boring, who still, by all accounts, has to buy friends and apparently makes everybody at the Daily Wire call him their god king, you know, as a fun joke. Anyway, I sincerely hope that Jeremy Boring is able to get that emergency leg extension surgery so he can finally grow out of the bruised ego he should have grown out of in high school. With that being said, please enjoy the not quite director's cut, now mutilated version of my Lady Ballers review. Ah, uh, The Daily Wire. What more is there to say that hasn't been said by more eloquent people than me about the far-right outlet that's probably most responsible for pushing words like wokeness and the culture war into modern conservatism? While the outlet consists mostly of failed entertainers, and we'll get to that in a second, it hasn't stopped them from cosplaying as proficient creators as they've dug in their little heels and begun protesting woke Hollywood through a variety of films and services like Bent Key aimed at children. Watch Savvy Writes Book's latest video featuring me on the subject and keep an eye out on my channel for the follow-up to that video next week. But their lack of competency for even the most basic tenets of things like filmmaking or comedy hasn't stopped them from making a full-length film. The film in question, Lady Ballers, went a little viral with its trailer earlier this week and what can graciously be called an ad campaign. I say graciously because most of the press for this film comes from this Daily Wire article uh, written by the Daily Wire, quoting the Daily Wire about a Daily Wire production for a Daily Wire film. I also love how they call their own movie triggering. It's like when a comedian says some shit you've heard a thousand times before and says, if it offends you, you can get up and leave. And then nobody leaves because it's not actually offensive. It's just tired and lazy. Speaking of lazy, the film follows a group of men who can't play basketball, so they decide they can dress up as women and just beat women at basketball. And if you have a firing neuron in your brain, you might say, that's not how trans athletes work. Uh, trans women sometimes spend years under hormone therapy. You may also notice that the premise itself, at least as advertised, seems to essentially lead to the conclusion that the least talented male athletes could easily defeat female athletes who are trying. But if you've thought through these things, you've already put way more thought into it than the people who made it. Calling Lady Ballers a film is like calling a snuff film a documentary. Yes, on technicality, you can say it meets the standards of something being documented, but you have to question the mental wellness of somebody who not only decides to willingly watch it, but also revels in what's depicted. Lady Ballers is little more than an excuse for Jeremy Boring to get a group of people he pays to be his friends together so they can make fun of people who are different yet they make no effort to actually understand. It's like when Adam Sandler gets all of his comedian friends together and they make a shitty movie where they ad-lib through all the scenes, except instead of talented comedians doing it, it's Matt Walsh and Ben Shapiro. It's a collection of preconceived notions that will only be used to further mock and vilify innocent trans people who just want to live their lives. And you might ask, what actors would be willing to act in such a brazen propaganda piece I'm glad you did, because for the first feature-length comedy from The Daily Wire, they didn't get actors. They didn't even get successful comedians. Most of the cast is just people who already work there. Like Blaine Crane and Jake Crane, a pair of Nepo baby former basketballers who tried to follow in their superstar coach dad's footsteps and landed nowhere near success. 
Or Tyler Fisher, who had a brief role on America's Got Talent as a comedian and was disqualified in the auditions. He also had a walk-on in uh, Chicago Med in 2017. So some real just winners here. Daily Wire never beating the failed entertainer accusations, I'm afraid. And of course, what would a Daily Wire production be without the very normally sized human Jeremy Boring, who has never been made fun of for his name, by the way, not only directing, but starring in the lead. Ben Shapiro also stars, and channel favorite Matt Walsh makes an appearance. I'd say this is Matt's acting debut, but he's been pretending to have morals for his entire career, so I'd say he's used to performative virtue signaling. As of writing and recording this, I have yet to actually see the movie. And you might say, Dead Domain, how can you judge a film you haven't seen? And normally I'd be willing to have that conversation, but as somebody who's seen a lot of bad propaganda films and sketches and knows the telltale signs of when a comedian isn't telling a joke so much as just getting performatively pissed off at something, I can almost guarantee I know what the film will be like. But there's only one way to prove it. So with that, I bid you adieu until I return later in this video, by which time I will have sat through all two hours of The Daily Wire's first full-length comedy, Lady Ballers. Why, why, why do I do this to myself? Why do I do this to myself? So that was bad. Um, I'm doing this literally right after I just got done watching the premiere of Lady Ballers. And I, after everything I said at the beginning, I was not actually prepared for how depressingly like almost soul crushingly inept this film is. And I mean, I mean that divorced from its position as like a limp piece of propaganda that is like lazily and poorly written. This is a like deeply sad film, like deeply sad. The way Jeremy Boring writes up his own character in a movie that he made from his company and directed and starred in is like, do you not have any friends at all? I, I am no longer befuddled as to how they only manage to cast people really who work at the Daily Wire because no production company, no other director, nobody would handle this movie. It has nothing to do with like the core subject matter. It's just the sheer ineptitude of the comedy and plotting is so bad, I, I I struggle to think it would even capture the attention of like the production companies that made the slew of hangover knockoffs in the mid aughts. Like th this is subpar even by the standards of like Project X or Sex Drive, which are, are not good movies, believe me. So I guess let's just start right at the beginning where we see Jeremy Boring's character is a coach for a state championship basketball team and they're they're playing the big game and this introductory scene goes on way too long there are so many scenes in this movie that don't really know when to end and when they do they don't really know how to end it's a scene where they're getting down to the wire at the big game and it's a cliched setup you've seen in countless other sports movies and the coach needs to give a big speech. And it is actually truly impressive how poorly they perform shit that they wrote themselves. But coach, you're already a state champ. Two-time state champ. It's true. For me, this is a minor step back. For you boys, this is it. This is your shot. No state championship means... Well, it means no making your parents proud. It means no scholarship to Michigan. But Michigan's my dream. 
Already off the bat, there are these weird plotting jokes that just go nowhere, like this one kid being bullied repeatedly, and they just keep hitting him and shoving him inside the locker for the entire scene. And also, a bunch of the characters just go by their real names. Like, they are actually those people in the universe of the film, but for no real reason. Like, it's not like anybody knows who Blaine Crane is. It's not like a, a situation with Keith David in Saints Row 4. This opening scene and the locker room scene really give a good look at so many of the problems this movie has, like, throughout. Uh, no real sense of motion or momentum to a lot of the basketball scenes. The lighting is really just bland and bad, like, always. And Jeremy, as a director, doesn't seem to know really how to leverage angles to his strengths. And no offense to any short kings out there, but height is not one of them. And all of these angles where he is around these taller people and the camera is pointed down at him just make him look like goddamn Yoda. It's, it's a very odd choice and it's not like they're trying to point out how short he is. In fact, this movie goes to lengths to show what a cool and awesome dude Jeremy Boring is. And it's, like I said, it's really sad and I'll get to it in a minute. So I don't think it's trying to get at something like, oh, you see how short he is. They're not clever enough for that. They're just bad at directing things. And if you want a little taste of how this movie really wants you to see Jeremy Boring, there's a character who's kind of the cheerleader of the team who literally calls Jeremy's character a god among men. <laughs> You're a god among men, coach. I am, tall boy. I really am. It's Felix. And Jeremy just takes it in stride as if it's a true thing. Uh, then we get a shitty introductory sequence where all of the effects are either just PNGs that have been inserted into the film or done with very obvious after effects. I can't imagine why woke Hollywood wouldn't want to make this movie. We get another thing that is throughout this movie and that is shitty parody 80s songs. So already between the 80s songs, some of the really weird slapstick humor, the bits that go on way too long, and then the whole setup of being this like sports ball cliche of the coach in the big game. This movie is already running into a problem where it can't decide what kind of comedy it wants to be. It's taking a little bit from movies that they've obviously seen, and we'll talk about later where it's very clearly trying to ape moments from Adam Sandler comedies and plenty of Will Ferrell comedies, but it doesn't really know what made those things work and those characters in those movies likable to begin with. So you get this weird smorgasbord where in the end it can't decide if it wants to be like a scary movie style spoof or if it wants to be a Mel Brooks style shenanigans movie or if it wants to be crazy over the top or if it wants to be a kind of raunchy hangover style comedy and it never commits to any of those and that creates this really weird feeling where not only is the pacing off because you never quite where you never really understand how much of something is a joke versus how much it actually means to the characters and their character development. So in the end, you just walk away with nothing feeling like it meant anything because it all could have been a joke and there's no sense of sincerity here whatsoever. Anyway, the intro lasts way too long and then we cut to him being a high school coach and teaching a bunch of kids because kids are always on their phone and kids just be texting. And he makes a joke as everybody gets up to leave and there's one black kid, just just one that, that I saw, um, and he tells the group of kids not to steal his catalytic converter. And he says it basically looking to the black kid who comes over to him and says, you can't say that coach. And then the black kid drops a presumably stolen power tool. The joke here is that black people be stealing stuff. Am I right? Jeremy Boring, you lazy hack fuck. I cannot believe this dialogue. There aren't really jokes made about social issues to conservatives like abortion or trans people so much as they're just brought up and somebody will say a conservative talking point and then somebody else will give a rebuttal that is 
completely illogical or completely obviously ridiculous and then they'll just pretend that that's what like liberals and democrats and shit actually think and believe so he goes to pick up his daughter at school and we have to have a joke about masks right ah what a what a great one we literally cannot have a culture war talking point that we don't touch on in this movie that's already primarily focused on trans people except it's kind of not like, when, when you get right down to it, this movie is so scattershot and unfocused that all of the controversy they've been trying to drum up around it being this, like, scathing culture war piece is funny, completely divorced from any comedy they've, they've tried to put into the movie. Because this thing is just so, like, lame. Like, this is, this is the best you can do. Like you, you have you have Matt Walsh, you have Candace Owens, you have you have Ben Shapiro. These like titans of modern day conservatism, or so they would like to think. These people who are out there rallying every day against trans people. This is the best you got. This well, we'll see. We'll see later. I'm getting off on a tangent. I have I have my notes here. So as he's driving his own kid home, the kid starts talking about the Cold War and spouting off some lessons from history that no history teacher has ever taught to kids. In school, I remember barely being taught the Cold War because we spent so much goddamn time on the Revolutionary War and the Civil War throughout the year. Like, I was so pumped to get to anything post-World War II, and it almost never happened. What that big brain of yours learned at school today? We learned all about the Cold War. Oh, yeah? Our history teacher led us in a moment of silence for all the workers exploited by the capitalistic system. You should ask your history teacher which side people ran to when the Berlin Wall fell. What's the Berlin Wall? Oh, and Mary Margaret showed me her penis. Some boy showed you his penis? What? No, not a boy, Daddy. Gross. Mary Margaret, she's a girl. Girls don't have penises, Winnie. Mary Margaret does. Penises are weird. Can we stop saying penis, please? Where'd this happen, anyway? In the bathroom. Well, why are they letting boys in the girls' bathroom? Why do you keep us gendering Mary Margaret? Because the core demographic this film is aimed at, Daily Wire viewers, are primarily divorced, so is the main character here. Divorced and estranged from his ex-wife who is currently partnered with Matt Walsh wearing a terribly shitty wig uh, and doing his best impression of like a 60s hippie. It's just bizarre and feels like the kind of thing a 70 year old would think modern liberals are like. This is another case also in the scene of every angle just serving to make Jeremy Boring look as small as possible, and it's really weird. Also, so much of this just feels completely ad-libbed, and we see more of the scenes just kind of abruptly ending. Like, I think they're trying to end on a joke or a bit, but it doesn't land, because usually, a lot of the time in this movie, there's no real setup. Like, they, they might have an idea for a punchline, but they don't have nearly enough follow-through to just have it be a, like, one-and-done zinger, and then they don't have setup on the other end of it to really make you go, oh, I see what they did there. It's just, they think they're doing something funny, but they're really not. They're not connecting it to anything. Anyway, for some reason, Jeremy goes to this old business that he used to work at, and here we have a prime example of, D dude, d this angle does not make you look tall. Like, this literally just looks like that one Evangelion meme. So, the main character is an idiot who literally cannot look left to notice that he's standing in a diner that is full of cross-dressers. And I say cross-dressers because they are literally, like, accepted as men who are dressing as women in this bizarre... First off, it's only really shown one time. Second off, it's this weird amalgamation of, like, a Texas roadhouse, but all the servers are men, and not dressed in drag because they don't wear any makeup and their wigs are shitty, just like, it just looks like a lot of college dropouts who raided a high school wardrobe department. Like, it, it just, it, it looks fucking terrible. He catches up with an old player that he used to coach who makes an aside about straight white men not being able to get any roles in Hollywood, but that's, just not true and then Jeremy Boring makes a weird aside about the new Snow White being black and neurodivergent we have this scene in the alleyway where for some reason he is making his friend run and timing him and it strikes him that oh he could compete as a woman uh and then there's this guy who pops in who is very much doing a Rob Schneider you can do it style uh bit which he'll pop up throughout and just say how much 
the implication being that he's looking to prostitute the characters. And then again, the scene just ends with Jeremy Boring just kind of road running away from this weird deliverance reject coyote. So we are at a running event for women, and there's also a men's division, I guess. It's not clear what this is. This isn't college. It's not high school. This isn't like a local marathon. It's just a running event that also has like javelin and shot put, I guess. And the character who forgot to take off his wig from his job uh, gets mistaken as a trans woman. So much wrong with that on its face. And it's at this point we really get the thesis of the movie, which is Jeremy literally saying that any man... I, I said this earlier as a joke when I wrote the script. I, I didn't think they would actually put this in the movie, but they do several times. Basically saying that any man can beat any woman at a sport regardless of skill level. That the most unskilled schlubs can totally just cream like trained female athletes which jeremy i would love to see you put your money where your mouth is on that buddy do you have any idea how much faster even a man fastest prime like you is than a female athlete fastest prime high school boys can run faster than world record female sprinters you're gonna get out there and you're gonna beat these chicks i'm man says who i have a, that doesn't matter anymore look my eight-year-old daughter told me all about it this is the way the world is now this is wrong also it's incredibly impressive they managed to cast the guy with the most punchable face in the world Naturally, he just smokes the women in the race because he's a man. And even though that's not really how that happens, we talked about it in a video recently, you can go watch it, where it turns out a lot of the time that trans people don't just overwhelmingly win, especially trans women in athletics come in a variety of different places. It's a lot more fair and nuanced than conservatives want to make it out to be, and certainly more than anybody who earnestly consumes this film wants to believe so then this weird local event is somehow turned into a national sensation as the media covers this and we get stunning and brave bs because everything these ding dongs do is 10 years behind the times it, it, this whole thing is just thus far is completely nonsensical and and that seems to be the point but again because the focus is all over the place, you can never tell if they're trying to, like, satirize the modern media landscape or if they legitimately think this is how the world works. Also want to point out the After Effects they used on this scene of the local news camera shooting footage makes it look like they, they have CRT lines, but even local news stations use digital cameras. Um... And here also we get Michael Knowles and this girl, I've already forgotten her name, who are going to be the dodgeball commentator stand-ins throughout this movie, just peeking in and doing hysterical bits where they do things like dress up in indigenous people's headwear. And that's about it. And Jesus Christ, even the cis women have dog shit wigs in this movie. Also, watch this scene and gaze in wonder at how Michael Knowles' acting career never worked out. Well, I mean, as brave and beautiful as he is. She. She is brave and beautiful. Of course. But she does have certain advantages over a real woman, right? Well, Stacy, Drake, all I can say to that is, how dare you? Trans women are real women. And we had another scene that just ends abruptly. I don't know what the gag was supposed to be here. Did the, the news anchors like kill themselves? What happened? So the random person gets a Bud Light sponsorship, which just betrays that this movie was made entirely this year. And I can only imagine Jeremy in a seething, foaming rage over Dylan Mulvaney uh, because he just continually takes stabs at her throughout the movie. And they're all about the same level of laziness that you would expect. Then we have Spectre Vondergeist playing the role of a conniving journalist who convinces them to try and get into an Olympics equivalent, because they can't use the word the Olympics, so that she can cover their story and make a ton of money off of it. This character as a whole is such a weird bundle of conservative paranoia because they really want to push that the media can't be trusted at all. But... 
she believes the same things that they do. Like, she believes secretly, I guess, that trans women aren't real women and that it's an embarrassment to sports and all that stuff. But she's pretending to believe it because she thinks it'll get her paid, I guess. And she's orchestrating these grand conspiracies behind the scenes to cover this basketball team so that she can get a Pulitzer? It's a very... It's so stupid. It's just... Like, even in a movie that is full of goofball gags, there should be some semblance of credulity. You need to have some basis in reality. Even in Looney Tunes, even in Coyote cartoons, where the craziest things can happen, you still have established laws like gravity. This creates stakes. This movie doesn't really have any of that. Like, the world just reacts in the most paranoid, conservative delusions possible always like there's there's nothing else to it and remember when i was talking about how sad this movie is to watch here's another scene where out of nowhere this fairly attractive young woman just pretty much demands that jeremy boring's character who again writer director owner of the daily wire demands that he have sex with her not you coach you're going home with me. You're a winner now. Every woman wants a winner. You literally just called me a cheating low Cool. One. Now put your tongue down my throat. Uh, because he's he's a winner now. And I can't even really believe how pathetic this is. And then we get the hysterical depiction of the aftermath of a BDSM session. Uh, because as obsessed as conservatives are with genitals, it scenes like this really tell you they've never had a sexual encounter with a flavor harsher than vanilla. They then need to start building their team. So they go to the Crane Brothers, played by real-life Crane Brothers, who I mentioned at the beginning, who own a used car dealership. I, I suppose it's funny that there's a girl in crutches for some reason. There's not actually any jokes made. I think they just think that the idea of somebody being in crutches alone is funny. Because it's, it's quirky and weird. But they didn't even, like, try and make a joke here. Also, I love all of these signs made with the exact same font and, like, no other branding that definitely weren't just printed out day of production. And then we get a nice A24-style centered shot here. Somebody's been watching some Ari Aster, which makes sense because this movie is a fucking nightmare. There's also this great moment where it shows off these dork sad little basketball cave where the camera literally, like, pops in and out of focus. And then, of course, we get a joke about a Merce. God, they want to be him so bad. You're not really wearing that, are you? Wearing what? The man purse. You actually gonna wear that? You guys just fucking with me. It's where I keep all my things. I get a lot of compliments on this. Plus, it's not a man purse. It's called a satchel. As we continue on recruiting the rest of the team, we get a Predator parody because referencing things you saw as a kid is hysterical. There's there's no setup for jokes here. Like we're we're like a half hour, forty minutes into the movie. There has barely been anything I could consider a joke. Like, seriously, the pacing here is so terrible, it can't decide if it wants to be a movie parody with things like the Predator Vision, or a Mel Brooks knockoff, or a raunchy Will Ferrell-style comedy with things like the lady just feeling him up like Ricky Bobby's wife. It's so all over the place, and it's just ridiculous the entire time, but none of it is funny, none of it is clever or interesting or even slightly engaging. Uh, as an example, in the next scene when they're trying to convince this wilderness man to come join the team, they all call him fat, even though he's like quite clearly not, but there's no additional joke there. It, it's almost like one of the Adam Sandler bits that he would do in a movie where he'd ad-lib some insults really quick, but they're just calling him fat. Like, there's there's no additional joke to be made there. It sounds ad-libbed, but these aren't trained comedians. At this point, I'm like 40 minutes into the film, and I gotta tell you, I am decidedly untriggered by the most triggering comedy of the year. 
Oh, and then the scene, something explodes. It's never really explained how that works. And then the scene just ends as like this. This is just how they end a scene. Great. And then we have a literal ad for Jeremy's razors, which are ads that also pop up throughout the rest of the movie. I also forgot to mention earlier in the scene where Jeremy looks like Shinji from Evangelion. Uh, there's there's some of his candy on the counter in the store. I'm assuming because they couldn't get the license or ability to use anything else. And scenes like this do call to mind goofy movies like Wayne's World. The difference there is that movie didn't have a writer-director star write in how they're a sex god and a god among men. So it's actually funny to, to see that scene versus this just being like feeling like some kind of weird Ponzi scheme. Of course, we get more misplaced 80s parody shit for some reason. Like this movie isn't really modeled after 80s sports movies, but they continually put in like these montage scenes and things that are very clearly trying to evoke that. It's a lot like South Park, but even in South Park, it's just, it's done 10 times better because there's actual jokes there. So they go and find the last member of the team who was the sad kid who called Jeremy Boring a god among men. And apparently he lives in a weird cat McMansion and has a full scale replica gym from their time in high school. And I wanna pause and say that at no point does anybody find this sad. Like, like a actual good joke to make would have been how these grown men who really amounted to nothing are chasing after the one time they felt relevance in their life in the form of high school and cheating to get that relevance back. But nobody ever points that out because I don't think Jeremy or any of the writers seem to have known how sad that is. Or maybe they do and just don't want to touch it because it's too close to home. Also, the Badger PTSD character has that one trait that gets brought up a couple more times and then completely dropped. That's a plot line that is never actually resolved, but it's it's funny, right? No? So it isn't until an hour into this goddamn film that we finally get the core conceit, the thing that the controversy started with, and this film was advertised as that a group of men are going to dress as women and completely dominate women's sports. How kooky. Jeremy gives another dumbass speech, which apparently just unlocks this lady's floodgates. I mean, she is, she's ready to burst like a submarine full of billionaires. Oh, sorry, too soon. That joke was edgier than literally anything in this controversial film. And at this point, I really almost started to tune out because I just do not give a fuck about any of these characters. This is so boring. It's so poorly paced. The drama between it all is just nonsensical. And what's worse, the the events that connect everything are just so tenuous that like if you if you don't pay attention you'll easily lose the plot because there's barely one to begin with so then the eight-year-old walks them through how they can all identify as women and what i imagine is a 70 year old conservative's idea of what school children are taught and it's just hilariously wrong and again so self-evidently stupid oh and the scene ends with just Straight up misogyny. Women are just like men, only better. Just shave your legs, tell each other how brave you are for things that require absolutely no physical courage, and don't be afraid to cry at work. Easy peasy. The joke here is that women aren't good at doing things and men are better at doing all those things. This movie brought to you by people trying to quote unquote defend women's spaces. Then there's more of this embarrassing shit where this character from Knowles and What's Her Face are clearly just ripped right from Dodgeball and this sucks because they cannot act to save their lives. <sighs> we get more literal ads for Jeremy's razors too. Guys, I'm getting paid like 50 bucks to be here. I don't care. Oh, that was just Ben Shapiro on the job. 
Yeah, no, they, they, like, he was just wearing that and happened to walk into the studio. Naturally, the team of men just completely destroys the woman team and they're hailed as stunning and brave. But wait, the most controversial canceled triggering film of the year bleeps out two F-bombs. Technical, and you shut the f up, transphobic mother Oh. I have seen domesticated chihuahuas less tame than this bullshit. So the not women's team wins, the world reacts how literally nobody would uh, because this isn't how trans people or sports work. And then suddenly people start filling the stadium or at least the front half of the stadium they could afford to fill because the ADR is not reflecting that crowd size. And because we haven't talked about it all, we have to reference abortions for half a second in a very weird aside. As much as conservatives like to bitch about virtue signaling, there are so many times in this movie where they just literally talk about something that has nothing to do with the matter at hand just so they can get their little jab in. Just so the Daily Wire can let all their viewers know, hey, we, we hate masks too. We, we hate abortion too. Like, kind of like they're, I don't know, signaling some kind of virtues to their audience. We get more dog shit music in a montage scene with Riley Gaines making her big screen debut and just looking overall very confused. She's got that look down pat. I find it funny how people like Riley were talked up as being in this movie like it was going to be some kind of conservative Avengers or Expendables when they literally have like mere seconds of screen time. And then we also get this poorly shot scene that I think is supposed to be synchronized to the music, but it slows down and speeds up so frenetically, and then the blurs and zooms are all over the goddamn place. It just looks like a mess. We get a look at players being interviewed on a woke talk show, uh, which is just making fun of literal people who have been sincere and open on those talk shows because people like Jeremy Boring are just cynical and have not a bone of sincerity in their body. Uh, we get some uh, fun trans age bullshit, which is not something anybody seriously argues for, like, at all. Because unlike gender, age is not socially constructed or represented. We get more Dylan Mulvaney shit because these fuckers got so mad when they see her serving like this. Except we're reaching a twist. One of the characters actually starts thinking he's a woman. What a quirky surprise. Is this going to go anywhere? Fuck no. Also, this character has barely done anything to socially transition, which, granted, somebody's transness or non binaryness or however they want to identify is not contingent upon how they look outwardly, but a lot of trans people seek gender-affirming care because they feel an overwhelming sense of dysphoria brought on by the disconnect between how they perceive themselves and how they want to be perceived. Nothing even approximating this part of the trans experience is ever even referenced in this movie because they don't actually give a fuck. So then they're playing a game and Ted Cruz walks on screen like a goddamn cast member from Duck Dynasty on a God's Not Dead movie. And that's Ted Cruz's cameo. Wave at him, there he is, goodbye. The dipshits get in a fight and some reason that brings scrutiny down upon them because we need to have some semblance of a problem and just need to keep tormenting the audience at this point. And then we get the girl child saying she wants to be a boy because boys are winners and then she lists off a bunch of stuff that she factually believes boys are better at only for jeremy to say well yeah boys are better at pretty much everything but girls can have babies boys are better at everything oh honey that's just not true they're better at basketball okay yeah basketball and swimming Okay. MMA. That goes without saying. And running, and javelin, powerlifting, shot put, hockey, karate, football, pole vault, driving, parking, most of the stem fields, rock and roll, opening pickle jars. Okay. Yeah, boys are better at all of those things. But those are just things, Winnie. Which is a very weird thing to say to a child. Like, your inherent value is entirely in your uterus, six-year-old girl. He tries to turn this into a lesson about how women are good at some things, but not the things that boys are good at. This is like just some of the most blatant, sad misogyny I've ever heard. Also, this comes out of absolute nowhere. Like they just 
needed a place to put these talking points in and he couldn't figure out a better place than to just literally let his character monologue about it. This scene also bugs the hell out of me because the lighting is all over the place. Like, they, they literally just used what looks like the room lighting for most shots. So you get these moments where some characters look like they're way too tan and some characters look way too pale in comparison. And they might not even be on the same stage because the camera keeps going back and forth. This is another issue they have is that so many of these shots are just like one, two shots where they'll go from one character to the other and never show them together. So you get this really off-putting sense of scale where you're never quite sure where people are standing in relation to each other. Like if they're even in the same room, for example. Jeremy caught John Wick on cable one night, so we get to open this scene with some very stylish two-tone lighting before the lighting scheme just shits itself again. And then for some reason we get these statistics about divorce off the top of this character's head, like this is an after-school special. And then listen to the shit, they want to call out tech oligarchs as being behind things like the trans agenda, while people at the Daily Wire have been really big fans of Elon Musk, a tech oligarch. I stake my entire future on this. These transhumanist tech oligarchs and nihilist college professors have already convinced every self-righteous housewife with Munchausen by proxy to sacrifice their kids on the altar of false virtue. Here we have this great stock footage of nothing, I guess. These motherfuckers still can't act. What the fuck? Oh, to get ready for the big game, they repeat this quote that they're really trying to turn into a if you ain't first, you're last Ricky Bobby type thing. And it's, God, I've already forgotten it. Winners are just losers who win. They say it at the beginning, say it a few times throughout. It's, it's, obviously supposed to be a dumb like catchphrase for the movie but it's like not only is it dumb it's a blatant ripoff of something else much like several other gags you may have noticed through this film which just take all the teeth away from it like you're you're not coming up with any original jokes the movies that you stole from the reason people like them is because of those original jokes you don't have those but, uh-oh, another team had the idea that this team had, so they've got to fight black dudes. Whoa! The black guys, of course, beat them because black people good at sports. And we get a montage that ends with a guy getting hit in the balls, but this movie can't even do a classic ball shot correctly. The camera's not even focused on the nards. Like, what are we doing here? One joke that actually got a chuckle out of me was this running bit between the Crane brothers where they're meant to play in real life. They're not identical twins, but in the movie, they were something, something. They were twins that were basically conceived at the same time by two sperm from two different guys. And the joke culminates, which is a very dumb thing, but it's set up for they end up sleeping with the same girl who announces that she's pregnant to them which is actually a bit that did did get me to chuckle. In any in a better film that would be some great setup, but in this that's that's pretty much where it ends. It it has that one punchline, but that's that's about it. Anyway, I've lost track of time and for some reason this shit is still going. I don't even know why. Even after the dad told her that she's not good for anything but babies, the girl is for some reason proud of her father, and it's this kind of rousing moment where for some reason now he's inspired to get all the guys to come clean and stop lying about being women and just admit that they're losers, I guess, even though they don't really admit that. And also, this plan was his idea. He roped them all into this, and... Nobody seems to bring up that fact. Like, he gets to just get off scot-free at the end of this, and everybody says that he's the best coach ever. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, we have this dumbass scene of Michael Knowles really relishing this indigenous headdress. Um, they say every journalist is a lunatic, which is hysterical from a news organization. We go into the final part of the final match, and there's no real sense of flow or establishment or stakes or anything, and I just did not give a f f Things have just kind of been happening. 
So we need an excuse to wrap all this shit up. They decide to come clean and let a bunch of little girls play to en enjoy the, the spirit of the game. Even though we just got done talking about how girls aren't as good at anything as boys are. Uh, for some reason, again, tonally all over the place, the dominatrix journalist turns out to be a assassin who tries to shoot Jeremy. This is never brought up again. Uh, the character who is having possible dysphoria earlier turns out to be trans, except not really because Jeremy has some words of wisdom, where he gives this speech and basically says that no parent should be proud of their trans kid. I'm proud of myself for the first time. Our parents are proud of me. Your parents ever not been proud of you, bud? What do you mean? Your parents love you, Alex. That's a good thing. Parents should love their kids unconditionally. They shouldn't be proud of you unconditionally. They should only be proud of you when you do what's right. And what we've done here, this, this isn't right. You're confused. I get that. We all get confused sometimes. And if you need help, buddy, I'm going to help you get on that. you got to believe me when I tell you this. You are not a woman. You're just a lost man in a lost world with shitty parents and a real shitty coach. We've all gone along with this lie instead of just hurting your feelings and telling you the truth. This is so wildly wrong and misguided and disgusting, but I almost have a hard time getting mad at it because of how stupid every other aspect of this film is. Like, literally, the, the whole point of that scene is that parents shouldn't be proud of their kid when they're wrong about something and being trans is wrong. Except they don't actually say that. They just like to say things like, women dressing as men is wrong, or men dressing as women is wrong. There's another fight. The black guy shows his dick to the crowd. Um, hilarious. Hilarious. But, aw, how wholesome is it that the kids come out and they play and they still lose, but they had fun doing it. And that's, that's apparently the joy of basketball. It's a, it's a lesson none of us could have learned without an insecure man-child writing himself into a movie where women just wanted to throw themselves at him and he gets to say that no parent should be proud of their trans kid. Camera work here, unsurprisingly dog shit like the rest of the movie. Uh, there's no sense of movement or weight or momentum and it's just bad and I've stopped caring at this point. The journalist assassin comes back to trade some barbs with him. Nobody seems to care that she very obviously tried to split his head like a cantaloupe and she just leaves and that's never resolved also the other guy's gender dysphoria never resolved the thing with the the two twins never resolved like these things aren't really wrapped up in any way that feels true for the characters aside from a quick one-offs where jeremy gets to spout whatever conservative nonsense he wants to magically solve the problem and so we're left wondering, what was the point in any of this? We flash forward months later, uh, the twins reopen their car dealership. Jeremy is literally called the best coach ever after he lied to the world, admitted to lying, and then broke a bunch of promises and disappointed a bunch of people. But I guess not. It's all better now because he's, he's a, a winner for some reason, even though he did lose. And I would argue is still a massive loser but this guy cannot do anything wrong in this movie. Like, literally, nothing he does can be wrong. He can only be cool and sell razors and chocolates and be called Gone Among Men and get hot ladies who just want to dominate him just throwing themselves at his feet. Like, that, that's obviously the life this guy knows. And here's the real, the real kicker. What feels like a credit scene like an mcu movie but it got pushed to the very end we pull out and uh jeremy's ex's boyfriend played by matt walsh is actually a secret villain the whole time who's been pulling the strings but candace owens is there too and for some reason they it, they're like the cobra of this fictional universe that also includes real people from the daily wire like what what is going on here is never made clear um matt walsh does name drop the sweet baby gang which is cringe as fuck and also where this stupid ass plush comes from and it just feels like another merchandising tie-in so daily wire can keep selling their dumb bullshit which i honestly think sums up so much of this film this movie 
when it first dropped a couple days ago, the trailer, so many people were worried about how, I guess, gross and transphobic it would be. And it's not even... Like, there are obvious jabs at Bud Light and Dylan Mulvaney and Caitlyn Jenner and a couple other things that all conservatives know off the back of their hand because they've just been inundated with this culture war bullshit from people like The Daily Wire. But it's so inept and so confused and so scattershot that it's really hard to get mad at it because put aside it's... it's position is very obvious and blatant hateful propaganda which it is that don't don't get me wrong it is that but on a very basic level like it fails to be a entertaining or good film like it it fails the most basic tests of quality of acting of writing and probably most importantly for a comedy being funny like this shit uh, sucked it was maybe a half hour if not 40 minutes too long with scenes that go on way too long don't know how or when to end and should have been cut like like entire scenes that should have been cut bits that feel completely ad-libbed in the worst way possible because they're not done by talented comedians and then this bizarre streak of self-aggrandizing of jeremy's character like gives the whole thing this very sad pathetic desperate feeling from a bunch of people who are well known to have not been successful in areas of entertainment like writing, acting, and directing. If you watch my channel or you're a fan of my channel, I probably don't have to tell you not to spend $70 like I did to go watch this pile of garbage. But if you are for some reason looking for a review to see, ooh, maybe I should spend however much Daily Wire is now that Black Friday is over and go see this, don't. Like, like, Go watch a different movie. <laughs> like, literally, go watch any average movie from, like, 10 years ago. Go watch any comedy. Go watch Hangover 2. Like, that that has more questionable, possibly transphobic stuff in it than this does. And that actually has talented comedians. Like, Hangover 2, not a great movie by any stretch of the definition. But it actually made me laugh. You know, it actually had ideas to it. It actually had competent direction. It actually had competent actors. This movie has none of those things. Not only is it just confused on like the message it wants to send and anything about the issues that it's trying to tackle, it doesn't it doesn't even know how to be good to begin with. Hey everybody, late night editing Jordan here. I want to thank you all for watching. I worked really hard to get this done and out as soon as possible, so I hope it is informative and somewhat enjoyable because I can safely say I got no joy out of watching this damn movie. On that subject, seeing as how this movie is not only going to be controversial, but also I do swear a couple times throughout the video, and uh, I'm also using a lot of footage from The Daily Wire, this video is probably not going to get monetize so if you wouldn't mind i do appreciate any support over on patreon or down at the links below because i do stuff like this as a full-time job and when i don't get ad revenue on those videos it does hurt a little bit all that having been said i hope you stick around for some more videos coming soon including uh my collaboration with savvy rights books if you haven't watched her excellent first part of our our collaboration please go to her channel subscribe and watch that now and then my uh follow-up to that should be coming soon Aside from that, it is very late and I'm going to go to bed, but I appreciate you so much for watching and I hope you have a great rest of your day.